Authorship on scientific papers is regulated by pretty clear guidelines published by various agencies, for example, the ICMJE, and I'll link to that in the description below. However, this is not nearly as easy as it seems, and therefore this can be pretty tricky territory to navigate, especially for early career researchers. So here are some things to think about, and this is by no means complete, and I can also really not offer clear-cut guidelines for every situation, because a lot of things will depend on the particular situation of the paper, you and your co-authors, but it's uh, some general food for thought and some things to keep in mind. And we're starting right now. So first I'd like to talk about um, what are the costs and benefits of having co-authors on a paper. Then I'd like to chat about how do you go about inviting people and the two major modes for inviting people to be co-authors. And then finally some points about author position and the need to always be communicating about this topic. So first about inviting co-authors and the costs and benefits of doing so. So obviously there are clear advantages to inviting co-authors, for example, and especially if they cover particular expertise that you don't have or the other co-authors don't have, because, because that will enrich um, the manuscript with content and it will provide the relevant expertise you need to make a more well-rounded paper. So that part is basically clear and this is the underlying motivation for everybody to bring co-authors on board. However, when you invite your list of co-authors, you should be aware that there are also costs. There are several situations when costs can arise. For example, imagine you have invited co-authors and among some of the co-authors there is a disagreement on either minor points or a major point in the paper. Now, that in itself is not tragic, especially if the other co-authors can resolve the issue by themselves. However, if they can't, then basically it's up to you to manage and to mediate among the different parties. And that creates um, a lot of effort on your end and also costs time. And in the end, this may end up not being terribly productive in addition to being time consuming. Now, Thankfully, that doesn't occur very often, and I would have to think back a long time until maybe that was the case for the last time. But still, this can happen in your case, and so it's something to keep in mind when you select the people to be co-authors. Of course, it's different if the very point of your paper is to resolve some of the existing disagreements in your field, and that becomes um, the point of your paper, right? So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when I'm talking about a situation when this disagreement arises on an unforeseen point that you basically you didn't see that one coming and the paper is actually about something different. Also consider that the more people you invite to be co-authors, the more people with very busy schedules you have to deal with in the end. Now it's not just the writing of the manuscript where you might have to wait longer than you like for the input of some people because they're busy and have other things to do, but this basically happens the entire life cycle, if you will, of your manuscript because not only will you have to seek, of course, approval from all co-authors before you can go ahead and and submit the paper for the first time and the various rounds of revisions that go before that. But also when you're being asked to prepare a revision from a journal, you will again have to cycle the paper and the point by point reviews to reviewer comments to all the co-authors and always get the agreement from everybody until such a point where you can move on and then when it's published or accepted for publication and then you know everybody has to agree on the page proofs and so on. So basically it is not just the writing stage where you have to deal with all these people and their busy schedules and the potential delays that come with that, but you always have to deal with that throughout the entire life cycle of the manuscript. And that can also be a cost. The way to get around that is very clearly you need to set deadlines and you need to say like, if I haven't heard from you by such and such a day, I will assume that you're okay with the contents and I will move forward. Otherwise, you're going to drive yourself crazy. Other situations can arise when one of the co-authors or several of the co-authors do not deliver. Now, this 
basically happens very rarely, but it does happen. Now, how do you deal with that situation? <laughs> do you remove these authors? How do you justify that? What is your criterion for removing somebody from authorship from a paper? Do you burn bridges by doing that? And do you incur negative karma in some way going forward? So it is tricky, right? When you have many authors, you have to manage these authors and situations like that may also arise. Also consider that if you have some co-authors that deliver very little in terms of content to your manuscript and you have other co-authors that deliver a whole lot to your manuscript, then you basically, by having everybody in the list more or less on an even footing, you decrease the value basically for the ones that have contributed a lot in your author list. We are just, we are just listed just like everybody else, maybe alphabetically or in some fashion. And then there's a, a couple of um, authorship positions that are more prominent. We'll talk about that um, in another point here. Um, but there's only a limited number of them, right? There's first author, there's corresponding author, and there's senior last author in ecology anyways. So there's only so many of these prominent authorship positions you can give away, even though sometimes it can lead to shared first authorship or shared senior authorship situations because you want to basically reward people and acknowledge people for having contributed more than the average co-author on your paper. Still, if you have a long list of co-authors, this is basically a cost for the co-authors that have delivered a lot. Still, this is basically a, a hidden cost, basically not necessarily to you, but to the co-authors that have contributed a lot to this particular manuscript. Now, how do you invite people to be co-authors? And there's basically two modes, and maybe this is not known to many people, generally speaking, but there is the opt-in and the opt out mode of co-authorship invitation. And it may seem like the differences are very small and maybe not meaningful, but they are. So what does that mean? <laughs> Opting in authorship means that you are being considered as a co-author on this particular manuscript, but you don't appear with your name on, let's say, the first draft of that manuscript. So then it requires action from your end to basically justify to be a co-author on that paper that is opting in co-authorship. You're given the opportunity to be a co-author, but you have to act to become one. The other version of this is the opting out. So basically your name appears on, let's say the first draft of this manuscript that you are being sent. And opting out means you are going to be a co-author unless you specifically act to remove your name. So then you have to be active to remove your name. So you can see, these are actually subtle differences, but in the end it puts the person that's being invited for co-authorship in a different psychological state. In one case they have to act to add their name, in the other case they have to act to have their name actively removed, for example, you don't be associated with this paper. What is important is that you should make clear, either explicitly or implicitly, explicitly by stating this is an opt-in authorship model or this is an opt-out co-authorship model or by making it clear by basically putting the name there. You have to make it clear either explicitly or implicitly under which mode you're operating so it's uh, clear to everybody involved where they're at. There's no inherent real advantages to doing one way or the other. It's just depending on so many factors, like if you really want somebody on this paper because of the expertise is very dearly needed to make this point and to maybe have the whole paper assume a higher level of credibility, then, you know, the opt out would be a better option to choose because then the name is there and so they may be more likely to keep their name um, on the paper, all things considered <laughs> and all else being equal. Now we've talked about advantages and disadvantages of adding co-authors, how you go about adding co-authors with the opt-in and opt-out model, but by having taken the step to add somebody as a co-author, the decision really doesn't end because not all co-authors are created equal. It's an authorship position matters a lot. Now this is a bit tricky because this differs from discipline to discipline and even within discipline from country to country. So for example, in ecology, it's meaningful who the first author is and who the senior or last author in a particular manuscript is. Whereas in some disciplines like physics, authors are typically just listed in alphabetical order and then the authorship order means nothing. 
And in some countries, it matters who is the corresponding author, not who is the first author or the senior last author on a paper. Like in Germany, the corresponding author is not so important. What's important, who is the senior author? But in Germany, even who is corresponding author on a paper may also become important later on because this is how it's often decided if uh, publication costs are being reimbursed, for example, for open access publishing. And this can really make a difference of a couple thousand dollars in the end, this um, little thing of who is the co corresponding author on your paper. And also some labs have rules, like for example, our lab has the rule that if you're a PhD student, typically the the PI of the lab is the um, corresponding author, but if you're a postdoc, you are the corresponding author. You can see this is quite complex and there is actually an entire language of authorship. So if you look at some of the papers with many authors, you will see the first author. Sometimes the first author is being shared among two people, sometimes even three people. Sometimes there's multiple corresponding authors and multiple senior authorships that are being shared. And then you can see there are some groups of authors that are listed in alphabetical order because they probably contributed to something uh, in the writing or the analysis of the manuscript. And there is a whole nother <laughs> list of authors that are separately listed in alphabetical order, maybe because they delivered data for this particular manuscript. So this is quite complex. It's a whole language of co-authorship. And this is why it's important that the co-authorship order is also being discussed upfront now, you may think this problem is basically solved by having this authorship contribution statements that very many journals now require, which says like, you know, ABC um, contributed to the writing of the manuscript and uh, author such and such uh, did the statistical analysis. But the fact of the matter remains that in the end, this does not show up in your CV, right? What shows up in your CV for all practic practical purposes is the authorship order that ended up being in the published paper and not this very detailed statement of your contribution. And therefore, it's of course important to negotiate, to discuss, to communicate about it. So this leads me to the most important point of this video in the end is that whatever you do with authorship invitations and authorship orders, you must always communicate about it. You communicate with the people concerned. If you're a PhD student or a postdoc, it is vital that you also communicate with your advisor or your mentor. And nothing is worse than leaving out somebody who should actually have deserved co-authorship on a paper. So therefore, it's very, very, very important to carefully consider authorship and also the order of authors on a paper. So I hope this was helpful to you. Um, good luck with your next paper, all your co-authors, and see you in the next video.